God and the mission that he has put forth before us as Christians and as a body of Christ. What is this mission? What are we supposed to do? We're here for more than just existing. We're existing for a mission. We're here to do something for God. God has, God has called us to something. Today we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning of verse 1, 1 through 16. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. So if you have your Bible, if you want to turn with me there, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we all reach unity in faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by the every wind of teaching and by uh, cunning and craftiness of men and their and in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body joined together, is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Over the past few summers, Twin Cities Christian Church, we've talked about this, has went down to Missouri, Lamont, Missouri, to serve at Show Me Christian Youth Home. Some of you have had the opportunity to participate in that, and there's been a variety of things that we've done. We've worked with the, clo the clothing and donation barn. We've went in there, sorted things. We've pulled weeds. We've done a variety of things. We have had parents' night out for kids, uh, for the kids where we've done crafts and games and activities, and they've had a great time, and it gave the parents, the house parents, a much-needed break, much-needed time away. And we've been working on another project that's carried on the past couple of years, and we'll probably continue to work on, which is the prayer trail. And this is what we've been doing there is we've been building a variety of obstacles. We build a climbing wall, these wood slats that are really tall, and they have to help climb that wall. We have a spider web contraption that they use that they have to work through. We have a plank cross where we lay boards across, and you work together to go across these planks from one place to the other. The obstacles were made, though, not just for fun, not to test the construction abilities of Twin Cities Christian Church, because if that being the case, a couple years ago we failed because one of them was wiped out two weeks after we left. But we fixed it. It's better now. It wasn't for that purpose. Those things existed for a different reason. The obstacles were built in order to create unity among the kids. They existed for that purpose because you see the kids that were there, the kids that come into Show Me Christian Youth Home come from a variety of backgrounds. They come from different hometowns, different families. They come from different backgrounds, ethnicities. They come from a variety of different places all converging upon Show Me Christian Youth Home in Lamont. They're brought there for a variety of different reasons, um, issues with their families, but they're all there, and they're all unique. And Curtis, the guy that's in kind of in charge of this area, the reason he wanted this was not just for fun, not just for something to do, but to create unity amongst that group, to create a bond with the people. They had to work together to lift someone up through these little spider web holes. You couldn't do it by yourself. You couldn't climb the wall on your own. You couldn't use the planks by yourself. Some of our kids tried to use the planks by yourself. They tried to run across them really fast and try to make it. You can't do it. It doesn't work. They did this to build unity to accomplish these tasks. 
and that's why they existed. As we seek to understand what it means to be a church on mission, we're going to be exploring Ephesians chapter 4. And the Apostle Paul is communicating to the church at Ephesus that as believers, they must be unified. They must be unified as a body. They need to be working together. And we too must understand as followers, we must work together to accomplish God's mission. In Ephesians 4, we find three lessons that we must understand. If we're going to be unified as a body, there's some things we have to understand. There's some things that we that Paul tries to get across to us, some things that we have to pick up if we're going to be unified on this mission. The first one is this. It's found in verses 1 through 3. And that's this. Live a life worthy of God's calling. Ephesians 4, if you want to turn back with me there. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Paul begins by identifying himself, who he is. He identifies himself as a prisoner for the Lord. Paul at this time was a prisoner. He wasn't a free man here. He's talking about this. He said, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. He's chained to a guard awaiting a verdict. If you look at Acts 28, 16, you can see that. It's a matter of fact. If you turn with Ephesians, turn me to Ephesians 6.20. Ephesians 6.20, Paul says this. So you get the picture. He says, For I, which I am an ambassador, talking about Christ, an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. He's an ambassador for the gospel. He's chained up. He's locked up. He's lost his freedom as a result of what he is proclaiming, the message that he is carrying out. You see, Paul's proclamation here reminds the readers that he deserves a right to be heard. Okay? Paul deserves a right to be heard in this passage because he's living out his faith. And it cost him everything. So it matters what he has to say. What he has to say carries weight. It's not just some guy pontificating. It matters. It makes a difference. He has been chained up, locked up, sold out for this very thing which he believes. This following Christ. So he's saying pay attention. So Paul goes on to say, I exhort you. And the word that he uses, paralekio, in the Greek, and this is not so much seen as a command to do something, but to join forces with the speaker, to join forces with the one that is saying something. It's a call to action. So Paul's talking to the church at Ephesus, and he is calling them to action. He's calling them to do something. He's calling them to something important. And Paul is urging them to recognize the purpose that God has called them to and live their lives accordingly. So that's where it starts. If we're going to be unified in this mission, it starts right here. It starts with us. It starts with making sure that we are right with God. And we are called as the disciple of Christ. It's a high calling. It's a high standard. It's not something that's easy. It's not something we just sleepwalk our way through. This is a high calling that we were called. As one commentator put it, Paul's exhorting the people to be what you are. Be what you are. Be a disciple. This is who you are. Now be it. Do it. This is a high standard. It's not this simple thing. To understand what Paul means, Paul breaks down what it looks like to live a life worthy of the calling. So what does it look like? What does it mean? He says, first, he calls them to be humble. Now, this would have been really odd in that time to be humble because there was a negative connotation that came with being humble. You didn't want to be humble. In that world, that wasn't what you wanted to be. You wanted to be the best. You wanted to be the one that was in charge. You wanted to be the one that had the say so. You wanted to have the power. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Not a lot has changed. But he's saying, you need to be humble. And this would have been an odd idea, an odd concept. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, however, it begins with a positive message. God will bring down the proud but exalt the humble. So we know when we're humble, God is with us in that and will lift us up. He also says we are called to be patient with other people. This is difficult. Just head out on the road for about 10 or 15 minutes. It's hard to be patient as you're driving. That's just one small example of day-to-day -day thing. But we're called to be patient. We're called to be patient with people. We're called to be patient 
with people outside of the kingdom. We're called to be patient with people that are sitting amongst us today. We're called to be patient with one another, patient with everybody that we interact with. We're called to do this just as Christ and God has been patient with us. Turn back with me to, to uh, 2 Peter 3.9. We've been the recipients of patience. We should know what it looks like. Paul writes, or uh, Peter writes this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, God knows all about us. He knows who we are. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He knows when we drop the ball. He knows when we score touchdowns, metaphorically speaking. He knows all of those things. And he's patient with us. He sees our weaknesses. He sees the things that we do. And he's patient with us anyway. And he's saying, I've been patient with you. Now you need to be patient with one another. How do we go about doing that? Do we demonstrate that patience to people around us? Are we patient with how we talk to people? Are we patient when people do the same things over and over again and they drive us crazy? Are we patient with people that seem to be heading in the wrong direction and they don't want to listen? Are we patient with people that just aren't like us? We have to continue to be patient with one another in love. We're called to bear with one another. It means accepting their weakness and their faults. It has to be done in love. Now, I'm not saying we accept sin, that we accept sinful behavior, that we accept anything like that and say that it's good or saying that it's right. That's not the point. The point is that we care about the person. We care about those people. We love who they love them because Christ loves them. And we need to demonstrate that as well. We need to bear with one another and love one another. All this has to happen before unity uh, will develop and the, before we gain the unity that's required as Christ followers. You see, unity in the body of Christ starts right here. It starts with us. It starts with our behavior, how we act. We must live our lives worthy of the calling. Before we worry about what other people are doing, we need to examine our lives and say, am I living my life worthy of God's calling? Am I doing the things that are required of me as a follower of Christ? Am I doing these things? Am I demonstrating these things? Am I living out these characteristics? So how as followers are we living this life? How are we doing do we demonstrate humility, gentleness, and peace with each other? We like to be heard. Everybody does. We like to make things our own way and have things our own way. Are we people that listen first or are we people that speak first? Do we look at people that we encounter with the eyes of Christ, fellow sojourners attempting to live out their faith in a world of sin? Nobody has it all figured out, but we need to continue to make sure we are living a life, each one of us are living a life worthy of the calling, that we are all that we can be in Christ. From 1980 to 2001, the Army used a slogan that has showed up in literature and TV ads and things of that nature, and Patrick probably knows it because he was in the military and knows all about it. And that phrase, I can think back to my childhood, was this, be all that you can be. The Army was saying to youth considering this is an option to join the armed services, to join the Army. This is a good plan. Reach your full potential. Be all that you can be. Be all that you can be. Sometimes we sell ourselves short and we settle for something less than all that we can be. We settle for something that's second or third or fourth best in our relationship when it comes to God. We settle. We can't do this with our faith. We settle in a lot of areas in our lives. Sometimes we settle with our jobs, our relationships, our homework, whatever it might be. But when it comes to our faith in God, we can't settle. There is no settling. We have to make sure that we're living a life worthy of the calling that we've been given. Because you see... We didn't make up this call. I didn't make up this call. This is not Matt's call. It's not the elders of Twin Cities Christian Church's call. This is God's call. This is what God has put forth. We have to live a life worthy of his calling, the one placed on us by our creator, God himself. Are we attempting to skate through on this, 
Are we living lives that match what we say we believe? Are we living lives that match the, the way that we, what we proclaim, the God we serve? Do our words and actions represent Jesus? There's a second lesson from Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll pick up with that in verses 3 through 6, and that is this. We have to maintain a spirit of unity. Maintain a spirit of unity. Verses 3 through 6. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. Paul goes on to tell the church at Ephesus to make every effort. This is the quote. To make every effort to keep the unity through the bonds of peace. The Greek word that's used here is spuazo, which means to make haste, to push on with something quickly and zealously. We have to understand that. It wasn't just, yeah, we should get around to it, but to be zealous about it, to be aggressive about it. That we have to make every effort to work as hard as we can. It involves the total person. It involves all of us, our will, our reason, our physical strength, our attitude. We've got to make every effort, every effort humanly possible to maintain this spirit of unity. The oneness is something not to be attained. This oneness that we have, the oneness in the body of Christ has already been created by a spirit. It's something that we maintain. We don't create it. The spirit has made us one. Ephesians 2.22 if you turn back with me there, turn back a page. Ephesians 2, 22. Paul writes, And in him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We are a dwelling where God lives by his spirit, each and every one of us. We have been made that. And we have to make sure that we remain unified in that. Paul goes on to list the seven things we all have in common, the facts of this unity. We are one church, one body, the church, one body of Jews and Gentiles reconciled to God, one spirit that guides each and every one of us. God's spirit dwells in each and every one of us. When we accept him, when we submit our lives to him, there is one spirit inside of us. God's spirit's working in each and every one of us for his will and for his glory. There there is one Lord That's Jesus Christ, one faith. We put our faith in him. This common salvation, one baptism, one hope, and one God who is Father over each and every one of us, through all believers. This is our heavenly family. We can be unified around that. We have to maintain this spirit of unity that he has called us to. Paul has broken this down for us and revealed what it is we have in common. It's not this casual thing, this passing interest, but it's the very essence of who we are. This is who we are in Christ. We're the same. We're unified together because of Jesus, because of God's Son, broken for each and every one of us. The world around us, you see, it seeks to divide us. The world spends a lot of time trying to divide people. And if you don't believe me, just turn on the TV for a second. The world tries to divide us out. It points to all our differences. But the believers, you see, are called to something else. We're unified. First and foremost, our top priority, the number one thing is Jesus. It's not anything else. It's not whether you're an Iowa fan or Nebraska fan. It doesn't matter where you go to school. It doesn't matter where you work. What matters first is that we are followers of the Most High God, that we've been bought with a price through Jesus. That's where our unity comes. That's the most important thing. We spend a lot of time debating a lot of issues, but the primary thing, the primary focus has to be God's word, that we study from it, that we know that our salvation comes through Christ. That's where it comes from. We have a mission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Reiterate that mission. We can't read this enough. Because it's so important. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We are called to make disciples and carry forward what was set in motion over 2,000 years ago 
We need to continue on with this mission. In order to do the things that we're called to do, we have to work together. This isn't Matt's mission. This isn't the elders' mission. This isn't individual people's mission. This is all of our mission. We are the church. We are the body of Christ going out to win the loss for him, to make disciples. It's all of our responsibility. It's all of our jobs. And it's a big job. And it requires each and every one of us to accomplish it, working together towards this common goal. This is what we're called to do. Because we are focused on what's most important. Unity in the body doesn't mean we're always going to get along. It doesn't. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree on everything. But we have to remember what the main thing is, what the mission is. It's about speaking the truth in love. No gossip, no anger. It means keeping our focus not on the temporal but on the eternal. Focusing on what's most important, the mission of winning others for him. In this country at the moment, uh, at this time in history, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of been a buzzword that's been thrown around a lot. And the word is unity. We hear it a lot. We hear it talked about on the news. We hear it written about. How can we be more unified as a nation? We're less unified than ever, I've heard people say. And I don't know if that's true or not. But people have declared that, so it must be true, right? It's on the news, it's on the internet, so that must be a fact. I don't know. But people tend to argue that. How can we work together? Groups have been formed, meetings have been held in an attempt to accomplish this. Everybody thinks that they have the answer. As Christians, though, we're called to unity. That's something bigger than all of this. We're called to unity through Christ. The mission depends on it. What we're here to do depends on it. We need to remain focused on what's most important because when we're not, the mission is compromised. And ultimately, people don't get to hear the good news. When we're not unified, people miss out. The gospel's not preached. And this is what we're called to do, and we failed. We have to make sure that we remain unified on what's most important. Our unity is so important because the message, the mission is so important. Salvation is so important. Eternity matters. It matters for everyone. This has to be the common thread, being unified through Christ. There's a third lesson that we learned. Um, It's found in verses 11 through 16. We need to be people that are serving. 11 through 16 of Ephesians chapter 4. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith, and until uh, unity in faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, that teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up in him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body, joined together and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Paul outlines here the various gifts that God has placed upon some of the people as leaders. First, the apostles. Those are the hand-picked people by Jesus sent forth. These men were promised this inspiration by the Spirit. If we look back, we see that these were Spirit-filled men. John 14, 26, we see this. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all these things. It remind you of everything I have said to you. The Spirit's working with them as they carried out the mission that Jesus had set forth. They were filled by God's Spirit, appointed by Jesus Christ himself. Some were called to be prophets. These were the ones that heard from God and helped to guide and to lead the church by that inspiration from God. Others were evangelists, the proclaimers of good news. This work of the evangelists we see pointed out, and we just read it in Matthew 28. But verse 20 said, In teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We're called to teach. We're called to take that message. We're called to proclaim that message, these evangelists, and carry that on until the end of the age. Still some are called to be pastors and teachers. And the word that's used here for pastor actually means shepherd. It's to shepherd the flock, to take care of the flock, to protect them, to guide, to lead, to help them. 
This is what they're called to do. And these weren't the only areas of leadership that Scripture reveals. If you look through Scripture, you'll see some other things as well, some other areas, some other areas of giftedness. All of us you see are called to serve. We're called to use the gifts that God has given us for his glory and his honor. The idea is that we all should be prepared to go out. This mission of telling others about Jesus is active. It's daily. and It has to be taken seriously by everybody. So the question for us is how are we serving others? What are we doing to take this message of Christ to a lost world? How are we being prepared? Are we ready to go? Are we ready to do this? God's plan is to use us, and we have to be ready to answer the call and to follow where he leads us. We have to continue to be built up. We need to continue to invest knowing God's word, spending time with God's word, spending time through prayer. We need to continue to be built up and be ready so that we can be people of service to go out and to take this message, to carry out the mission that Christ has put forward for us. We need to be unified in what we're doing, not focused on our own preferences, not focused on what we want to do, but focused on the mission, focused on the service, focused on the message. That's what we're called to do. These are the important things. We can't allow ourselves to become distracted by unimportant things, the things that don't matter, the things that that will be here today and gone tomorrow. You know what? How many church buildings are around a hundred years from now, not very many. There are a few. So it really doesn't matter, does it? But the message that's proclaimed from there really does matter. We need to make sure that's what we're focused on. That's what the important thing is, the mission. Taking that out to the world, being people of service. There are many jobs that come with continual training. And I couldn't even list all the examples because there's so many different jobs. But there's Military training, fire training, fire and rescue, educators, doctors, technology. These people all the time are being trained. They continue in the continual process of being trained for the job that they're doing for their chosen field. When they're continuing to be prepared to be the best that they can be. As followers of Christ, we have to be prepared too. We have to be prepared knowing God's word and listening for his voice, listening for his call each and every day. It's an active living out our faith daily, being guided by the Spirit and telling other people about Christ. Each and every one of us as followers of Christ have to work together to accomplish God's mission. We have to live our own personal lives worthy of the calling. Make sure that we're living a life worthy of God's calling. We have to make sure that as a body that we maintain a spirit of unity with one another. And finally, we have to be people of service as we seek to win the world for Jesus. This time we have an opportunity to make a decision. Maybe some of you have yet to make a decision to make, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and join this mission to be a part of this mission of telling others about Christ. Or maybe you would like some prayer and some encouragement in this process. We'd like to encourage you to do so. Or perhaps you'd like to make Twin Cities Christian Church your church home and join us officially on this mission. We invite you to come as we stand and sing.